ইউটিউবে হোক শুরু করব গুড ইভিনিং এভরি ওয়ান আই এম নীলেন্দু চ্যাটার্জি অফ বঙ্কিম সর্দার কলেজ টুডে উই হ্যাভ উইথ আস প্রফেসর ডক্টর দেবাশিস মজুমদার অফ হেরিটেজ কলেজ অফ ভেরি রেনাউন প্রফেসর প্রিভিয়াসলি হি ওয়াজ প্রফেসর অফ ইকোনমিক্স অ্যাট বঙ্গবাসী কলেজ নাউ হি হ্যাজ জয়েন্ট হেরিটেজ কলেজ আফটার হিজ রিটায়ারমেন্ট উই নো হিম অল হি ইজ আওয়ার ফেমাস দেবাশিস স্যার অথার অফ সো মেনি বুকস উই নো হিম ভেরি ওয়েল now today we have with us our principal sir dr tilak chatterjee who will be the moderator in this pro moderator of this program as well and we have professor gargi bosu of joypuria college and professor urmi mukherjee of sanjeevias college and professor ruby pal of lady bremon college so this program is on development economics which is the core course paper that is cc14 So Professor Mojumdar will deliver his lecture and students are asked to write down their question like the previous webinar in the chat box of YouTube. We will read it out and this is although this is a program of economics but we have with us another person, another professor from English, Professor Devanjan Banerjee who has been helping us in every case. He has been behind the scene for all the webinars so we are very much grateful to him. So without further ado, I would like to ask our principal sir to say a few words and then Professor Mojumdar will start his lecture. Over to you sir. As rightly pointed out by my fellow colleague. As rightly As pointed right. out by my fellow colleague, that I have to say only a few words. I won't be much lengthy. Prathamai boli, ee onushtan shudur ang prarongi korpe, amar maa shankhub dhoni di ee onushtan ee rududan bol. Shunda kale shudur hai cha boli, ee shujok ta khote gala. Prathamai boli, this is our 12th webinar this is our 12th webinar since the pandemic started in 2020 march 2020 nilendu chatterjee my fellow colleague decided to be in touch with students in kolkata uh, he came forward with this idea that if we form whatsapp group and remain in touch with the students of kolkata economics honors then how do you see to it i heartily welcome his intention and cooperated him in all possible ways so that these groups are formed presently we have about 150 students of the sixth semester about 140 students of the fourth semester and about 250 students of the present second semester all the students they are in constant touch definitely they do hold certain expectation from us and we believe that we are fulfilling their expectations in the field of uh coming uh, offering them certain opportunity to listen to this type of webinars which are mainly related to uh, the subject today it is development economics yesterday it was macroeconomics on 26th it was public finance uh, on 18th of july it would be mathematical economics so the students they get something from these webinars this is purely students webinar students are uh supposed to listen and get benefit thereafter they raise several hundreds of questions they raise in the whatsapp group and myself and ilendu 
uh, we keep in touch with them 24 into 7 and try to fulfill whatever questions they ask not the academic questions, questions about what books to be studied, from where to get those books. And in 90% of the cases, we provide those books, whatever books are available in the uh, soft copies. And uh, definitely they are benefited out of it. We also provide them with certain guidance about how to prepare for the master's uh, entrance, starting from JNU to all other institutes. So they are also they get certain benefits, but the most important benefit that they receive is what we understand from their feedback, which we frequently take, is that uh, they feel that when these groups continue to function throughout the year, throughout the months, they feel that they are not alone, and even our heart gets filled up with this pleasure that. In this stage of pandemic, when we are locked, when we are locked down in our home, at least economics honor students in Kolkata, they don't feel that they are alone. Uh, that we are able to be with them definitely is our uh, topmost satisfaction. And we will continue to remain with them uh, as long as possible. Um, our spirit group. পরিষ্কার সেটা হচ্ছে আজকে এই সময়টাকে লকডাউন বলা হচ্ছে আমি নীলেন্দুকেও এটা বলি আমি সবাইকেই এই কথাটা বলি উই আর লক বাট উই আর নট ডাউন আমরা একেবারেই ডাউন নই আমাদের স্পিরিট হাই আমাদের মন খারাপ করে না আমরা সবার সাথে আছি মৃত্যু ভয় পেয়ে কোনো লাভ নেই অপেক্ষায় আছি কবে আবার কলেজ খুলবে খুললেও আমরা সেই পুরানো কলেজ পাবো কি না পুরানো form of teaching learning other babokina etc these are different stories um actor feedback this is for uh, devashish mojumdar professor devashish mojumdar i want to communicate one small message to the speaker of today that one feedback was conducted among the six semester students that uh, how much of your syllabus is completed so 72% of the students have given one opinion, a very plain and simple statement. 72% of the students, they have given one feedback that um, not more than 60%. Some of the students have said about 80% is completed. Some have said less than 40%, but the majority, the 72%, that is three out of every four students have said that not more than 60 percent so i believe that they are in not in a very good situation uh, it is only one month few days left about 40 days left not even that uh, um, so in this situation uh, i would expect that this particular webinar as presented by uh, Professor Devashish Mojumdar will fulfill their needs and whatever uh, guidelines or whatever roadmap that Professor Mojumdar will be providing to the students will come to their help in the coming three weeks time so that uh, they can prepare and I hope they will be raising questions even after this webinar and I hope that Professor Devashish Mojumdar will remain in touch with me or Nilendu to fulfill several questions that they would be raising even after this webinar. Uh, without wasting much time, uh, having said few words about our intentions of forming this group, having said few words about our activities during the last uh, one year, and having expressed our expectation from Professor Devashish Mojumdar after completion of this workshop, I would uh, like Professor Mojumdar to uh, start the program. Dr. Mojumdar, you may please start. Okay. Uh, very good evening to all and uh, when uh, present in this webinar. And uh, I feel it a great honor uh, to be invited by uh, 
Bonkim Shortar College uh, for giving this uh, presentation that is discussion on the syllabus development economics for semester six students and uh, respected Dr. Tilak Chatterjee, principal of Bonkim Shortar College. I'm really thankful to you. Uh, Dr. Nilendu Chatterjee, Dr. Urni Mukherjee, Dr. Gargi Basu, thanks to everyone who are present here, all faculty members of different colleges who are there, my dear students. Today, at the very start, uh, really it is difficult to uh, just spell each and every topic at, in details within the limited time frame. But uh, my plan is to just give a short guideline so that you can understand the underlying, say, this main feature of any particular topic and how to address any particular question. Okay, that is the main objective. And which are the areas uh, that you must <coughs> emphasize because uh, examination time is coming. It is uh, within one month you have to sit for your final end sem examination. So keeping uh, all these, uh, say, constraints in view, I have prepared a guideline, okay? So uh, I want to present uh, my document and I share my screen. Is my screen visible? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, it is visible. Yes, it is visible. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I now start. it's visible. Okay. So, the paper is Development Economics, uh, semester six. And unit, uh, according to the unit, uh, unit wise, I, should, I shall discuss. I start with the first unit, uh, which is meaning of development, uh, uh, economic development, where normally uh, the syllabus indicates income approach and capability approach. Okay. Normally, uh, broadly, whenever you uh, say listen to any particular lecture, it starts with this paper starts with the basic difference between economic growth and economic development. Actually, I prepared the I prepared the whole document. Um, uh, for the benefit of the students, particularly. So, uh, what is the basic difference between economic growth and economic development? Economic growth, uh, normally it indicates the quantitative aspect of economic progress of a society, quantitative aspect. For example, you can measure it on the basis of, say, uh, say uh, in terms of GDP per capita, real GDP per capita, or GNP, or per capita GNP, or investment or uh, say gross investment, gross domestic investment, gross savings, whichever uh, is quantifiable, you can measure the growth process on the basis of these indicators, okay? So uh, that is uh, one approach. So income approach suggests that economic progress of a country can be measured in terms of the growth of per capita income of the nation, okay? Or growth of per capita real income, because that is uh, considered to be uh, the most easiest way of presenting the economic progress of a society because uh, GNP, GDP, in whatever uh, at, uh, say a method you uh, quantify the aggregate, aggregate value of your output of the nation, uh, that is the culmination of say productive activities of different sectors of the economy. Okay, for example, primary sector, secondary sector, and the tertiary sector together they produce a particular value. And that value is being represented with the help of that gross value of output, okay, be it GDP, real GDP, or GNP, real GNP. Uh, and in, in, in the sense of per capita, why? Because you deflate it in terms of the growth of population. While your output is rising, your population of the country, particularly in case of any less developed country, the population growth is also very important. So uh, to uh, deflate uh, this income growth by the population growth, you get the per capita figure 
and if you observe that per capita income per capita real income is rising that is that will definitely represent an average i uh, say um uh, say in, in increase in the well being of the people of that society that is normally that is accepted but that income approach has been uh, so challenged by different economists okay they believe that income approach uh, is not enough to understand the broad spectrum of economic development of a country because economic development is much broader term compared to economic growth economic development as opposed to economic growth it considers the qualitative aspect of economic progress of a society okay qualitative aspect for example here i have given uh, the uh, this uh, opinion of dennis gulle the famous economist uh, he suggests that if you want to uh, um, say measure uh, the economic development in the true sense of the term then you have to consider uh, three particular core values of economic development one is life sustenance you 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 you, you must be aware of the life sustenance that means whether maximum people they are getting their minimum necessities of life that should be taken into account and then self esteem that is self respect for example if uh, uh, in uh, during the colonial period in india <coughs> people didn't didn't have that self respect we were under the colonial uh, power so that self esteem is also very much necessary self respect and its expansion is also necessary to estimate the level of economic development of a country and the freedom freedom from poverty freedom from squalor freedom from ignorance these are some of the core values of economic development so whenever you study economic development in broader perspective then several aspects you have to take into account for example you have to take into account unemployment <coughs> whether it is falling level of poverty and whether it is falling say infant mortality rate then infrastructural facility then uh, say uh, average living standard for that you can take into account the per capita income also real per capita income so all several aspects taken together uh, you you consider the economic development so that is the basic uh, uh, difference between economic growth and economic development and <clears throat> one question which uh, normally you will face in your uh, in the final exam that uh, basic difference between economic growth and development and whether a per capita output or real per capita income of a nation can be a good uh, indicator can be considered as a uh, say acceptable indicator of economic development that is one very important question and then your answer will be yes <coughs> per capita income to start with it shows uh, <coughs> say as a, as stages of economic progress of a country no doubt for example whether it is a low income country whether it is a middle income country or whether it is a high income country for example as segregated as classified by world bank report every every year in the world bank report we will find that the world bank classifies different countries of the globe according to the per capita output of real per capita income in, in terms of purchasing power parity dollar ppp dollar they categorize different countries according to per capita income okay so <clears throat> to start with uh, per capita income uh, yes uh, uh, it it indicates the stage of uh, economic progress where the country is but it cannot indicate <clears throat> the crucial aspects of or the broader aspect of economic development of a country because um, if you uh, if you consider for example say sustainable economic development which is a very <coughs> sorry <coughs> important aspect so for example if there is industrial growth with with which uh, uh, gdp will rise but there is greater pollution with that pollution there is externality and people are suffering from that externality so you are you are to uh, uh, say justify uh, that while achieving that growth what are your opportunity cost okay that means you from the growth of income you cannot estimate the damage you are causing to your environment okay similarly uh, different countries maybe yes they are at the different stages of their growth process but only by seeing the level of income you cannot um, you cannot expect or you cannot forecast their future possibility of growth of nation okay future possible possible growth of a particular country because they uh, their um, uh, resources 
available in those countries may be different. And even if the resources are there, they may not utilize it properly. Okay. So although they are now utilizing and then now at a particular level of economic progress, which you measure on the basis of, uh, uh, say, per capita output, but you cannot measure the prospect, future prospect, because future prospect of growth, that will also depend upon the availability of <clears throat> availability of entrepreneurs, the institutions, I shall come to that point, economic institutions, political institutions, the environment, the attitude of the people, okay, the attitude of the entrepreneurs, the attitude of the government, everything taken together and whether say through their education policy, health policy, infrastructure policy, fiscal policy, monetary policy together, the country is able to attain a full-fledged economic development. So only per capita income, though it can indicate the trend, but it cannot indicate the broad economic development, broad aspect of economic development of a country. So in this way, uh, you uh, should answer, you should address this particular question that whether uh, per capita income uh, can be considered as a true indicator of development. Now, capability approach was developed by Amartya Sen. Uh, the capability approach of economic development suggests that, according to Amartya Sen, he's, uh, according to him, he suggests that the capability of the common people uh, that depend on the freedom with which they can change their environment. And their capability depends on their, their it depends on how well they can convert the characteristics of different commodities into their functionings. For example, I have this uh, particular a modern computer. I can have a modern machine, but I do not know. Uh, I do not have that know-how as a how to operate that machine. Okay. For example, I am an illiterate person, and you offer me you uh, with a very good book, but I cannot read it. So. Uh, I cannot convert the characteristics of a commodity into it into its functionings. So for that conversion requires some sort of capability in me. And that capability not only depends upon my endowment, that means the asset with which, for example, my landed asset, my physical assets, as well as some of the real asset, for example, in terms of my educational, my skill, which I get from education, my health, which I get from health facilities. So through educational facilities, through health facilities, I can acquire some skill and capacity through which we, I can convert the characteristics of different commodities uh, into their functionings and I become capable. And Amartya Sen believes that uh, that expansion of capability can be considered as economic development of a country. So that is a very beautiful idea through which you can explain how uh, capability expansion okay, uh, can be considered as economic development of a country. Uh, for, uh, similarly, uh, Amartya Sen was of the opinion that when you uh, define poverty of a nation, uh, he defines poverty as capability failure. Okay, so in his poverty and nation, uh, he indicated that uh, that poverty uh, may not uh, arise because of the shortage of food, but because of the capacity of the common people uh, uh, for uh, the purchase. They cannot purchase it, so they have some uh, say uh, some resource, but through the market forces, whether they can increase that exchange relationship, that is, whether they can uh, con convert that exchange relationship in their favor. For example, they have the labor power, but if, when they want to sell their labor power, they're not getting proper wage rate. Okay, when they want to sell their commodities in the market, they're not getting the remunerative price. Okay, so that type of exchange relationship between any human being, any worker, okay, any common people with the market, that also determine his capacity, his capability. So with this notion, Amartya Sen gave this idea that economic development of a country can be explained on the basis of the capability expansion. So that is the notion. And I think this is uh, how you can explain, okay, uh, uh, this uh, difference between the capability notion uh, uh, with the uh, income notion of measuring economic development of a particular country. Actually, whenever you are concerned with economic development, it is a normative approach. Okay, it is a normative approach because it 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 it, it emphasizes on some value approach. Okay, some ethical part of it, whether uh, the people should be uh, say uh, continuously ridden in poverty, or whether the government should take proper measure. 
to safeguard the people, common people from that type of, uh, say, poverty, whether the government should take proper measure to increase the capability of the common people, okay, to take measures for the development of the economy. So it is economic development, this whole idea is concerned with the normative aspect of economic uh, analysis. Uh, so that is uh, the first uh, uh, particular topic, uh, which I feel that uh, will uh, fulfill your need. If you have some extra uh, say query, you can ask me, or if you want some help from me, I'm always ready to help you. Uh, say these are the references. After every unit, I have given the reference uh, as well as the chapters from where you should study it. Okay, and then I come to the next topic, construction and interpretation of human development index. Human development index normally it is constructed by UNDP, United Nations Development Program, and it is an index to estimate the economic development, the process of economic development of a particular country. Okay. Uh, as we have already indicated that economic development is a broader aspect of economic progress, a qualitative aspect uh, are, are more important. So here, some of the variables which are taken into account while preparing human development index are life expectancy, okay, at birth, okay, that will that will represent whether the people are having healthy life, uh, then education index, then uh, income per capita real GDP. So not only per capita GDP, real GDP, but also we see some of some other I say variables are also taken into account to judge the human development, whether people at large, their quality of living is improving or not. Uh, uh, the objective is to capture that human development, that qualitative aspect of human growth. Okay, the uh, uh, the growing standard of living in a country in terms of human development index. So this is an index. To, uh, qual uh, so, uh, to just uh, want, uh, so to estimate the economic pro process of economic development of a country. And uh, this is the uh, uh, old method of estimating uh, a human development index before, uh, say, up to 2010-11 in the UNDP report, you will find this type of arithmetic mean of estimating uh, the human development index where three indices are there, life expectancy index, education index and per capita index and uh, just you divide it by three and you get an average index which was treated as human development index and in the education index they take two sub uh, say indicators one is adult literacy index and gross enrollment index and they they are the weighted education index is the weighted average of these two indices uh, more weightage was given on adult literacy okay two third weight and one third weight was given on uh, gross enrollment ratio. But for each variable, okay, there is a dimension index that you have to prepare. Where What is the dimension index? For each variable, for example, value of the ith variable in the jth country. For In each country, you have to take the value of any particular variable, for example, so per capita income, so actual value, real GDP uh, per capita, actual value, and the minimum value, whole divided by maximum value by minimum value. But that means when UNDP uh, uh, say collects the data from different countries uh, they uh, observe the range range means the maximum value and the minimum value so uh, in the denominator we have the range and the numerator we we are uh, actually measuring uh, for the concerned country what is the gap so the concerned countries gap as a proportion of the range okay that is the dimension index okay uh, now the new method instead of uh, say having arithmetic mean, they are uh, emphasizing upon the geometric mean because uh, even if in the old method, even if you have uh, say zero, uh, say valuation for any particular index, still you have a particular value of HDI. But here, since this is a multiplicative uh, a, a life index, education index and income index, if any one of them is zero, then the whole index HDI would be zero. So uh, this is a much more scientific uh, and an improvement over the old method. So this is a new method. And I am giving some example from the recent 2020 Human Development Report I have taken. Uh, please see uh, the rank of different countries, uh, some of the highly human developed countries, some of the uh, developed countries, which we call highly developed, say Norway rank one, okay, their life expectancy. For each variable, you will have uh, their values here and the index. 
HDI value. And here, as HDI tends, its value tends to one, then uh, uh, that country uh, should be considered as more developed in terms of human development. And it, as HDI, uh, say, approaches towards the value zero, uh, that country will be considered as less, less developed in terms of human development. Okay. Now, in the last uh, say column, we are taking a difference between the per capita GDP rank of that country uh, minus uh, uh, difference between the per capita GDP rank and the HDI rank. And if you observe that if there is a minus sign here, it means that in terms of per capita rank, per capita GDP rank, the rank of the country is higher. For example, in case of USA, you observe that uh, in the GDP, uh, in the HDI rank, it, its rank in 2019, it is 17th position. But if uh, it, its, its income position uh, in 2019 must have been 7, so 7 minus 17 is, uh, uh, or uh, sorry, 10th. Uh, its rank must be 10. So 10 minus 17 is minus 7. So uh, a country may be higher, higher, it may, may have higher rank in terms of per capita GDP, but may have a lower rank in terms of human development. So any minus sign, okay, uh, will indicate that, that that country may have higher rank in terms of per capita income, but lower rank in terms of human development. This precisely indicates that uh, a country may have growth in terms of per capita output, but that cannot indicate the development aspect. Here uh, is your example, which we have discussed just before, that what is the basic difference between development and growth. So per capita output will measure the quantitative aspect, while human development index will measure the qualitative aspect of economic progress of a country. Okay, So in India, our rank uh, was 131 among about 190 countries. Uh, India's rank was 130. So it is uh, not uh, very. India is not in a very good position. Uh, it has to increase in terms of, say, expected years of schooling, mean years of schooling. These variables have been uh, they have been added in in the new uh, new index. Okay, uh, in previously old index, adult literacy and education index was there. But wh while answering, please consider the new index. Okay, I would suggest our students to take into account the new method uh, where the education index is based on expected years of schooling and means mean years of schooling. Okay, I, I can give you an example. Uh, say to to a to measure the dimension index, uh, you must measure the maximum and you must have that range. And uh, UNDP in its every report it gives some goalpost. Goalpost means the maximum value from its survey it, uh, takes a maximum value and some minimum value. For example, life expectancy at birth, you observe that the minimum value according to the NDP report is 20 years. Okay, The maximum value is 85 years on an average. So when you measure, uh, say, life expectancy index, then in the denominator, the range will be 85 minus 20. And in the numerator, there will be, say, the average life expectancy of your country, of that country, in, uh, say for example, you are measuring for Bangladesh, uh, then uh, the life expectancy at birth for Bangladesh minus the minimum value. For example, here I have taken into account the Bangladesh uh, say case uh, uh, based on the data of 2018. And please see how life expectancy is being calculated. So goalpost is maximum value 85, minimum value 20. So that is the denominator, that is the range. And you are having uh, say what is your that is what is Bangladesh's case that is what is their deviation from that uh, uh, that particular value so 72.32 minus 20 so you get this particular index a life expectancy, expectancy index in this way you calculate the mean years of schooling index expected years of schooling index and this these are these goalposts are also there given in the uh, the, the report and then together you calculate an average and you get the education index. Income index is calculated on the basis of, uh, say, PPP, uh, uh, say, real uh, GDP per capita. Uh, and, and the log term, you are taking the natural logarithm. And a similar in a similar fashion, you can calculate the income and index and you take a, a geometric mean of that and you get the HDI. So uh, in this way, uh, in several steps, if the question is how, what steps are to be followed to calculate HDI. So you, you explain these steps and then uh, uh, say what are the variables which are, are taken into account in calculating HDI 
okay, what is the uh, 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 implication of HDI? You, you please explain. And while explaining, if you have time in the, uh, say for example, in six marks question, if you have time, in, then you indicate both uh, the old method and the new method. And you just indicate that new method is much more scientific compared to the old method. In this way, you can uh, give a proper answer. Okay, this is the outline and I have given some of the references you require uh, for uh, uh, giving this particular, for studying it for HDI. Now, international variations in development measure. So I have not discussed it at length, but I will suggest to you that when uh, this is a topic uh, in your syllabus, that international variations in the development measure. Now, there are two broad development measures. Uh, one uh, measure is called as the income measure, which is being followed by World Bank. And the other measure is uh, called as the UNDP measure uh, or a capability measure, okay? Uh, which measures the development aspect or the qualitative aspect of economic progress. So these are the two, uh, say, uh, say, say, two uh, dimensions of, uh, say, measuring uh, economic, uh, say, development. Okay. Uh, actually, one me one measure is income approach. Okay. Development measure, income approach. Income approach is also a measure of development, but it is a narrow measure. But the broader measure is uh, 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 UNDP measure. And if you study UNDP measure, you will observe that within the UNDP measure, even within HDI, we will find several other say, subsections of HDI. For example, say inequality adjusted HDI will be there. For example, uh, there is one measurement which will address the inequalities uh, among the male and female population. Okay, gender discrimination. Uh, 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 among the male and female, uh, female population in the country. And that is a better measure, okay? E effective life expectancy at birth. For example, uh, UNDP also expresses, instead of life expectancy, it expresses ex uh, e effective life expectancy. Effective life expectancy in, in that, you will find that UNDP emphasizes on the, uh, say, your total expected life uh, and, um, um, uh, say, and uh, the uh, years during which you suffered from different diseases. So your effective life is reduced if you if you suffer from different diseases. Uh, so uh, uh, if you deduct that, uh, uh, say, uh, troubled years during which, for example, you, were, you, were, you suffered from, say, COVID-19 for uh, six months because of typical health problems. So you could not, though you are leaving, but you could not, you could not effectively, you, you could not contribute towards the, uh, say, productivity growth uh, in any particular sector. So that should be deducted from your effect, uh, from your life expectancy to calculate the effective life expectancy. In this way, UNDP measure actually emphasizes upon the qualitative aspect of economic, uh, human uh, economic development. Okay, so in this way, uh, and uh, you will get it. Uh, some part you will get it in the Todaro Smith, and I have given that reference. Now, uh, comparing the development trajectories across nations, uh, here I have given uh, uh, some of the uh, guideline that how can you give this answer? Whenever you compare the development trajectory, development trajectory you, you can consider some of the variables. Okay, to compare, for example, you can you can take into account the infant mortality rate. You can take into account the gender inequality. You can take, a, a, uh, take into account the uh, life expectancy at birth. Even you can take into account the real per capita GDP. Okay, uh, but uh, if you take an index, for example, HDI, and take the average value of HDI in less developed country, developed country, and the world average, which I have made in one of my international paper, uh, which I published in 2016. Okay, the uh, title of the paper was the problems of development gap between developed and developing nations, which was published in Handbook of Research and Global Indicators of Economic and Political Convergence uh, in, uh, in IGI Global USA. Uh, I have taken this diagram from there, from my own paper. And here uh, I, have, I have shown that if you take a, a trend, uh, say, of, say, HDI values since 1980 to 2013, uh, you, uh, say, what you observe, this uh, blue, uh, uh, this bar, say, bar diagram indicate the average HDI value for the less developed country, the red one uh, indicates for the developed country, and the green one indicates the average, world average. So please see, uh, compared to a world average, always the developed country had higher value and the less developed country had a lower value. And uh, over time, although there has been uh, an increase, okay, 
and the trend is, is a rising value of HDI for both LDC, less developed country and developed country. Always you will observe that here the developed countries are well ahead, okay, uh, um, uh, the less developed countries. In this way, you can compare. This is an overall comparison and uh, you can also make uh, some uh, sort of theoretical comparison and you can show the convergence. This is an important aspect of, say, economic development, whether different uh, countries throughout the globe, whether the less developed country or the developed country, whether their growth, okay, whether their pattern of development, okay, in income growth is also a part of economic development. So whether that growth, economic growth is in converging, okay, uh, convergence and uh, say whether they are uh, uh, trending to a particular direction and whether the gap of them are uh, actually they're they are falling or it is rising or uh, that will indicate the convergence we normally we consider uh, say beta convergence where we measure the uh, say differences in the growth rates of income per capita income between the less developed and developed countries and we measure whether they are convergent or not here i have taken one example say i have taken uh, this particular method that uh, one less developed country, uh, I say uh, its uh, per capita income uh, is uh, uh, 1,800 US dollar and that of developed country is much higher, 35,000 US dollar and the rate of growth of income in the less developed country is 3%. Okay, growth of per capita income is 3%. Now, uh, so if less developed countries per capita income is this YLDT and the growth rate is this, uh, then it will require, uh, I say, uh, what will be that N after what, after what period they can achieve that uh, that present level of uh, income of the developed country. So here in this calculation, you are assuming that this YLD is given and given that uh, level of uh, income achieved by the developed country, what time period do you, you require to uh, attain that particular level? Uh, and then this N will be calculated in this way, log of YDT by YLDT, whole divided by log of one plus the growth rate of uh, per capita income in less developed country. And here, if you just put the value, you can find that uh, um, this uh, in this particular example, uh, it shows that about 99 years will be required for that less developed country to at attain that particular level. But uh, this is not true. In the meantime, the income of the developed country is also rising. So uh, the problem of catching up will always be there. Okay. In this way, uh, this is one aspect of how uh, that gap can be addressed. Uh, in another uh, say study by Kwa uh, in 1993, uh, there is a mobility matrix through which you can also um, uh, calculate the progress and the inter-country difference. Here, this mobility mat matrix indicates uh, in, in the column, you will uh, say, you will observe this one fourth, half, one, two, infinite. What does it mean? It means that there is an world average per capita income and if any country's per capita income is one fourth of the world average, then we call, call uh, we, we, we keep that country in the group, one fourth group. If the per capita income of a less developed country is half of the world average, then uh, we keep them in that group of half. If it is at par with world average, it is one. If it is twice that of world average, it is two. And it's more than twice, far above the world average, then it is infinite. So now the movement. So if you observe that during a particular time period, a country which was belonging to one fourth group is not, uh, after that period, you find, say, say after within 10 years, you find that they are uh, uh, still there in the same group. Then uh, 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 this is, uh, we observe that 76 of the countries, uh, they, they were in the same group in that particular study in 1993. Uh, 12 countries that could move from one fourth group to half. 12 countries could move up from one fourth to one, but none of them could move up to higher group. So this is the movement. This is the movement that their mobility towards development. So as, as similarly, the country with half of national income, uh, some of them uh, say, say just uh, their position declined to one fourth group. That means they could not move forward. There, there was the backward mobility. So uh, there are both forward mobility as well as backward mobility because of some uh, reason or other. For example, there may be several economic, uh, say, trouble, uh, natural calamities. There are several, say, obstacles for which a country may, uh, say, its position may be dwindled and it may drop down to one, say, 
any group below its position. Uh, uh, so uh, this is clear. No? So uh, the country at par, okay, they are moving, uh, they're moving, uh, say, uh, below its position, and some of them are moving ahead. So it is not true that always they can move forward. So mobility metrics is important in the sense that while you while you measure the economic progress of a country in terms of per capita income, the mobility can be either forward or backward or status quo. So this is a very important, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, say you can call it a measurement of uh, or a metrics so that you can measure the cross country uh, say progress in terms of their growth. Okay. Uh, and it, you will find it in the Ray. I have given you uh, some of the references where you will find it. Now, comparing the development trajectories within the nations. In your syllabus, this topic is also there. Within nation, uh, and I think that here you have to uh, give emphasis on the case study of the development dynamics in uh, some countries. You can, you can find the case study of Brazil, uh, the Bangladesh, Latin America, some African nations, uh, you can find case study of China in several uh, say development books and I have given some references. You can study it from there and you can show that how uh, uh, say uh, how those countries uh, they have moved forward gradually. For example, recently if you study uh, the uh, development trajectory of Bangladesh, you will find that Bangladesh have scored better okay, because of uh, its better institutions, uh, better political will, uh, 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 say uh, better policy measures. Okay, uh, so because of some uh, economic institutions, political institutions, better policy measures, a country can gradually say uh, move forward in its growth path in the path of economic development. And Bangladesh is one of them. And uh, and you know that through micro credit program. The, uh, this gender disparity in Bangladesh could be uh, could be reduced to a large extent, and uh, through some particular uh, development of some particular industries, and through some say banking, say monetary uh, say policies uh, of the government, and some of the uh, say uh, development programs, that country could flourish uh, in terms of economic development. Though, though there are uh, several say uh, uh, deficiencies in their growth process, but still, if you if you study that country specific trajectory of economic development, you can identify some of the uh, very uh, say interesting stories there and you can give some real life examples. So I would suggest that not only you study these reference books, you can, you can study also some of the reports, for example, even the reports, the World Bank report, Asian Development Bank report, where you will find these case studies. Okay. Now, next topic is dependency school of development. This is another aspect. Different groups of economists are there uh, who uh, suggest that uh, if you want to analyze uh, economic development of a country, uh, then you can analyze it in several ways. This dependency school of thought, they believed that it was developed during mid 1960s among the new Marxist economists. Okay, uh, among them we find Ravish and Singer. We find Emmanuel. We, we find Paul Baran, Andre Gunder Frank, Dos Santos, uh, then Cardoso, then Futado, then Samir Amin, all of them, okay, new Marxist. They believe that when the less developed countries, okay, they came into contact, okay, with the developed capitalist countries, it was believed that some sort of capitalistic production model, let's say, environment will be developed in those countries and that will add value to their say development process that means uh, uh, in in a, in a capitalistic mode of development if if a country uh, come in contact with that then it can gradually move from uh, say feudalistic pattern of a society to uh, industrialist in uh, say uh, cap capitalistic mode uh, and uh, gradually the uh, scale of production will increase uh, the country will open up they will be engaged in trade. Say so all sorts of uh, say good features of uh, capitalism can uh, can be beneficial for the economic growth. But ultimately, the dependency school of thought they believe that in uh, instead of uh, said economic development in those less developed countries, there was a backlash effect. That means if we consider these 
uh, countries, less developed countries as peripheral countries and the capitalist countries as the nodal central centers. They are called as centers. So center periphery approach suggests that when this peripheral countries came in contract, contract with the centers, then gradually more and more exploitative nature of or extractive nature of institutions developed. Okay, the political institutions were, were not inclusive in nature. They were much more extractive in nature. So uh, uh, what happened actually, for example, say some multinational corporations came in uh, and they adopted new technology, no doubt, but that was not very much uh, appropriate for the country. They adopted labor, uh, a capital intensive type of technology uh, and uh, there was uh, say drain of resources from the country uh, to the foreign countries. So this was the main idea of dependency school of thought the, and you can find these theories uh, in several uh, reference books okay and if you if you if you if you require something new something something more i can supply you you just uh, tell uh, me or uh, uh, just give me intimation that sir i i require this topic particularly in more details that i can send you no no so one question you can uh, say expect from this particular topic normally that is dependency school and these are the references and if you require something extra then you can write you, you can contact me okay you can write to tilak sat uh, our principal tilak chatterjee and uh, through him I, I can help you now you, you need to so please see that time uh, say i have a time limit i have to finish so uh, coming to unit two this is about poverty and inequality okay it starts with inequality axioms okay when you want to measure inequality okay uh, you start with some axioms there are four axioms or uh, say basic principles first is anonymity principle it suggests that when you rank people according to their income then the quality of that every individual is not important whether they are good people or bad people that is not important okay individual is anonymous only the ranking which is important population principle the size of the people in the country is not it doesn't matter what, in, what is important is in this case we want to measure inequality we want first we want to rank them according to their per capita income relative income hypothesis relative income principle or scale independence principle suggests that uh, say if you uh, scale down or scale up okay one inequality measure uh, by taking uh, say uh, say income distribution one income distribution is obtained by scaling everybody's income up so if you increase everybody's income by 10 percent then the measure that you get is equi equivalent to measure uh, without say uh, before scaling it up so it is independent of uh, any it is independent of scale so it is called scale independence principle or relative relative income principle what is important is relative income the dalton principle is one of the important principle uh, uh, it, it suggests that if you transfer say income from uh, a say low income person within the group to a high income person within that group then that will be uh, that will uh, really in uh, say in, in, say increase the income inequality okay that is called a regressive transfer if you transfer income from a less earned people a, a, a not so uh, rich people uh, you, you just collect some some uh, money and you just transfer it to a person with not so poor okay that means from a low income country to a high income country within that group uh, that will be considered as a regressive transfer now some of the commonly used inequality measure is range in this case of in the, this is the formula that you will find in the book okay in debra's ray and uh, this is the range of say maximum income and the minimum in that particular range okay uh, and this is the uh, new means average income of that group and the, this is this is one of the measures kuznets ratio is uh, another measure uh, it it shows the share of income of say richest x percentage say richest 20 percent divided by share of the income of the poorest 20 percent in this way kuznets ratio also measures the inequality in a country and uh, we have mean absolute deviation principle where we take the mod mod value of uh, the income minus the mean value of the income and uh, that deviations uh, across uh, the uh, different individuals in the group and whole divided by the total uh, income 
of uh, those people. Okay, this average income multiplied by the number of people in that group. This is called mean absolute deviation measurement of inequality, income inequality. And there is another measure, coefficient of variation. And you know that this is standard deviation divided by min. So it is root mean square deviation, which I have just explained without the mod sign. So this is standard deviation divided by the mean and you get the coefficient of variation. And then we, you come to the Lorentz ratio or the Gini ratio. These you are familiar with because those who have already studied statistics, you are familiar, familiar with this process that uh, on the uh, say horizontal axis, you are measuring cum uh, percent, percent cumulative frequency of income earners here. Okay. And according, uh, say, uh, along the uh, say uh, vertical axis, you are measuring percent cumulative frequency of income earned. Okay. And the income earners. So, for example, if 50% of the income earners, they receive 50% of the aggregate income of the society, 25% of the income earners, they get 25%. Then you get this line of equality, the, the diagonal line that is called the line of e equality. If there is any deviation formed from that line of equality, you get the Lorentz curve. And what is Gini coefficient? Gini coefficient is uh, the area in between the line of equality and the Lorentz curve that is indicated by C, area C, all divided by this uh, uh, triangle below the diagonal, uh, not uh, D, not in this way, or uh, A, B, D, you can call it A, B, D. So uh, uh, this is the area and that will give you, in, this is a simplistic way of expressing what is the Gini ratio, okay? And if there is no inequality, then the Gini ratio will be zero. And if there is perfect inequality, uh, obviously it will be one. So in this way, you can estimate the inequality. And then uh, we come to gender inequality. And what are the sources of gender inequality? Gender inequality means uh, inequality between the uh, female and male members in a society, in different fronts in the society, either in, in the workplace or in education uh, or in life expectancy at birth. Okay, there may be gender based inequalities. And the sources of such inequality, uh, I have given some indications. There may be health-based inequality, uh, inequality in the access to higher uh, educational facilities, inequality in the work workplace. For example, for example, there may be wage-based inequality. Okay, uh, inequality in the ownership of property, inequality at the household level regarding decision making. For example, you may observe that the uh, female members are not getting adequate, <coughs> say, independence in taking decisions at the household level. That is also an indication of inequality, statistical invisibility, invisibility of women in national income accounting. Because uh, in a less developed country where there is a large section of women who are there in the unorganized, say, agricultural sector, uh, whose uh, income are not being uh, measured because uh, they do not produce marketed commodities, their service are not marketed. So that is uh, another aspect of gender inequality. Okay. <coughs> and uh, you can also study some index, though this is not there in the syllabus, but you, if you are interested, you can uh, uh, you can study uh, the gender development index, gender inequality index proper, and the variables which are uh, considered, uh, there are several variables on the basis of which uh, the gender inequality index is being measured by the UNDP. Okay, for example, there you will find that women empowerment uh, is being measured in terms of their parliamentary representation. Okay, and uh, they are <coughs> uh, on the basis of their uh, health health standard, which is measured on the, on the basis of their maternal model mortality rate and the adolescent fertility rate, and uh, and their position in the labor market in terms of the labor force participation rate. In this way. Uh, if you study the gender inequality index, you can have uh, an idea of gender inequality in a society. Okay. <coughs> now coming to the topic of inequality and development. Just inequality and development. Uh, it actually it was developed by this idea was developed by Kuznets. Uh, with, the, with his famous inverted U hypothesis, he believed that with the growth in per capita income, okay, the inequality, the degree of inequality in a country, gradually it will rise 
and then after some stage it will gradually fall and he explained it in terms of say three factors first he indicated that at the first stage of economic say uh, this growth of a country uh, growth uh, uh, there will be some growth centers they will be concentrated in some few sectors or with positive growth and that will benefit more more uh, say a particular section of the people with uh, proper skill so uh, there will be inequality in the uh, economic, uh, say, economic, uh, say, uh, inequality in economic growth, inequality in the distribution of income, rather. So, um, at the initial stage of income growth, there will be higher and higher inequality. Why? Because growth will be concentrated in some particular sectors, benefiting only a particular group of people, skilled, better educated, those people. Okay. But after uh, a certain stage, there will be some compensatory change. They call it compensatory change. That means some uh, a linkage effect uh, through which other sectors will also flourish and more and more uh, employment income, employment and income opportunities will be uh, developed in other sectors of the economy and gradually income inequality will come down. So that explains the relationship between inequality, uh, pattern of inequality along with the economic growth. Okay, and that is important to you. And I have given you these references from Hayami and Devraj Ray. Then uh, there is another uh, topic which uh, is poverty measurement, uh, human poverty index, poverty trap, and path dependence of growth process. Poverty measure, uh, when you discuss the poverty measure, you start with a basic concept of poverty. Okay, Normally, we uh, call, call it there is a cutoff line uh, in terms of per capita consumption expenditure per month. Okay, And if any person is uh, below that uh, cutoff line, he is considered to be too poor. This is income measure, and there, there is another measure, okay, uh, which which is ex, uh, expressed or uh, uh, in terms of uh, calorie intake per capita. Uh, on an average, 2,250 calorie intake per capita per day, and if any person is observed to be lying below that uh, calorie intake capacity, okay, uh, level, uh, then he or she is considered to be poor. So these are the basic. Now uh, there is a concept of absolute poverty and relative poverty. For example, if you find that some people in a society they are absolutely deprived of the minimum necessities of a life some particular say food article they do not have some clothing they do not have the shelter they do not have so they are absolutely poor now what is the concept of relative poverty relative poverty means the income classification for example if there is income inequality in the society for example the total income is being say uh, say 20% of the rich people, uh, they are having, say, 40% of the total income. And say, the rest, 80% of the common people, they have the rest, 60% of the income. This type of income, income inequality may prevail both in less developed and developed countries. So relative poverty is observed both in developed as well as developing countries. But absolute poverty, that concept is very much relevant for the underdeveloped country. Now, how you can measure poverty? Some of the common poverty measure is headcount ratio, where you first identify who are those poor people and you express them as a proportion of the total population in the country and you get the headcount ratio. Then there is a, uh, a poverty gap ratio where you calculate the poverty line and the income of the ith poor, that gap, okay, and the, you sum, up, sum them up and you express it as a proportion of the aggregate income of the society where m is uh, uh, n is total population and m is the uh, mean income of the people so if you multiply the average income of the people uh, uh, with the total uh, say uh, population then you get the aggregate income and uh, it actually indicates that uh, how much amount you require to fill that gap poverty gap and here uh, th this is an a, this is a development uh, this is an improvement over pgr the income gap ratio shows the same gap, but here the denominator shows that you multiplied the head count, that is the poor person, uh, uh, with the poverty line. That means the income that you require to ma maintain those people on the poverty line, but what is the gap? Okay, so that gap as a ratio of income that is being required to maintain that poverty so on the line. And uh, there is another improvement by Ekeshen. Uh, in his, this is called sense poverty index where this is the index that he developed but p means poverty index equals to headcount ratio multiplied by in, uh, income gap ratio plus 
1 minus income gap ratio multiplied by g g means here the gini coefficient or gini ratio of income distribution among the poor this is among the poor because there is a criticism that this head count ratio or income gap ratio these this common uh, this poverty measures they are insensitive to income distribution among the poor for example if you make some dalton transfer income transfer regressive transfer from the poorer to the richer then the gap will remain same okay but the average will rise but that will not uh, make any difference because the poor will remain poor so uh, you must take into account uh, the income distribution among the poor so that was in the, uh, included in this improved poverty index developed by ekashen and here you observe that uh, if the gini ratio okay if there is no uh, say uh, inequality among income distribution among the poor then this g is zero then you get uh, a standardized normalized poverty index where poverty index will be the multiplication of uh, say product of head count ratio and income gap ratio that i have shown here and if you are interested you can study it then uh, human poverty index okay human poverty index is based on three variables p1 p2 and p3 and this is the formula where p1 suggests the population percentage of people not expected to survive up to 40 years so please see if you cannot survive if your life expectancy at birth is very low you are poor so this is not income poverty this is poverty human poverty from other aspects of our development okay so you are not here you are not interested about income poverty you are you are emphasizing something else for example p2 adult literacy rate okay so if you are not literate enough if in a society if this literacy rate is very low they are also poor and deprivation index on the basis of this p3 is a culmination of amalgamation of three sub subsets uh, percentage of people without access to safe drinking water people without access to health care services underweight children please see these are all indications of bad health okay poor living standard so human poverty index can be measured in this way and this alpha <laughs> if you consider this alpha equals to 1 then it just converts into a uh, just arithmetic mean of these three variables but if you uh, you will find that in the book book uh, you will find it uh, its value is 3 so <coughs> higher the value of alpha higher is your weightage on the importance of these variables in determining the human poverty <coughs> now uh, i have i have i have I've just this is my comment please note a link between hpi human poverty index and the economic and political institutions in a society in your last uh, unit in unit 6 uh, that this new unit has been uh, now added and i shall show you how it changes in the economic and political institutions in a society can change this human poverty okay so uh, economic you know, economic growth economic uh, say progress of a society will also depends on the pattern of economic institution in a society the pattern of political institution if uh, you if you have the freedom of expression if you have the freedom to choose okay in a society if you can take any production decision any consumption decision without any bindings without any constraint then there is, that is one type of institution but if you have if you are within the strict regulations for example consider say chinese political and economic institution and that of india quite different in terms of the democracy in the china the democracy index is very low but in india democracy index is very high okay so uh, you must consider this political and economic institutions under which the country operates and these are very important now for explaining the progress of a society and here i have given the reference now the poverty trap while explaining the poverty trap okay um uh, i have indicated here that this topic has a relationship with unit 4 because in the unit 4 you have uh, the topic like trap models lens nelson's trap model levens levenstein's trap model okay but uh, while explain ex explaining the poverty trap uh, 
uh, you have to explain this trap in terms of the low level income. Po poverty trap means a very low level of income which is just sufficient to maintain the subsistence standard of living and why you are trapped. Nelson has indicated that uh, the interaction between the output growth and population growth of a country. Okay, If you observe that during, uh, they have a relationship. He has established some relationship uh, with the per capita output, say population growth and per capita output, income growth and per capita output, and this relationship uh, that it shows that uh, uh, in a certain range of per capita output, population growth, if it is higher than the income growth, then even if through your, say, development projects, development measures, you can increase your per capita income from this low level, okay? Then again, you will slip back to that trap, okay? And that is such a trap where population growth is zero. Population growth is zero means your labor supply force, there is no dynamic aspect in the society. Your output growth is also zero. So you do not have any savings, you do not have any capital formation. So that is a stagnant society. So that, that is a trap. And that trap here is primarily because of higher population growth as opposed to the output growth. But if you can raise your per capita income beyond a certain level, then automatically the growth will lead to a higher level of income. So that is why you will find the theory of big push, the need for higher dose of investment. That means uh, some, uh, uh, sometimes it is called as critical minimum effort. This is the Levenstein struck model. And here I shall explain, uh, if, you, if you give me some time, uh, I will ask uh, our principal uh, Tilak Chatterjee because you know, uh, this is a very large uh, say um, this syllabus, and I have I have typed it out of my own despite my uh, some uh, difficulty with my say, eyesight. I have drawn these diagrams of my own. I have typed it of my own. So I want to share it with my students. So you please give me some time, okay? If you do not have any difficulty, so. <laughs> Levenstein strap model indicates two diagrams. One is ZT ZT. This ZT ZT indicates uh, income decreasing force, and this is actually the population growth path. You see, with the right accord, uh, say along the vertical axis, you are you are you are you are measuring per capita income and induced income fall. That means with the growth of population, there will be income decreasing force. So uh, here, with the growth in income, there will be an income decreasing force and that income decreasing force, there are several other factors, but the main factor is population growth and that is being measured by this line ZT, ZT. An income increasing force, per capita income and the income increasing forces, for example, the energetic entrepreneurs in the society and their um, uh, say more development, some innovations, some inventions, uh, say uh, they are reducing <coughs> their the vestige in the production process, okay, and that will create some income increasing force, and that is being measured by XT XT. And please see that if you have uh, here also the trap is at a very low level of income. Why not? So if you have Y one, if you if you can increase your income up to Y one, what you what happens? You have this forty five degree life line, which means that these two forces cancel out one another. And the deviation from the 45 line up to that ZT, ZT line will indicate income dep de depressing force. So if your income rises from Y0 to Y1, <coughs> that means uh, on the basis of income increasing force at Y1 level of income, your income increasing force will be AB up to XT, XT line. And by an amount AB, if, you, if your income rises up to AB, then your total income is OM0, OM0 and A1M0. Since this is a 45 degree line, they are equal. So you are measuring the distance between the 45 degree line and the ZT, ZT line as income depressing force. Please see, the income depressing force is A1C, but income increasing force is only AB. So the net, there is a net decrease in income uh, by, the, by an amount of BC. And when the income depressing forces of greater <coughs> weightage with greater force, there is a net fall in income, per capita income, then again, 
until it reaches at that low level, that income depressing force is much more powerful. So in this way, you are trapped until and unless you can say, help your country to move across that critical minimum, that YE level of income, only then your progress will be automatic. Why? Because in that case, your income decreasing force will be less than income increasing force. So this is Leibenstein's trap model and I shall explain it later on. Now, <laughs> why this type of poverty trap uh, becomes, make uh, it makes the growth path dependent. Why? Because this type of trap arises because of limited size of the market. Demand becomes limited and if the demand is limited, the size of the market is limited and you have to expand the size of the market through more investment, okay, <clears throat> through more investment and that investment, while making that investment, you can follow some growth path. Either you can follow some balanced growth path or unbalanced growth path. So your growth becomes path dependent. It means that the trap causes minimum size of the market and you need some trust in the form of some investment, but the modality of that investment, the process of that particular process may follow some particular path. Either it can be balanced or unbalanced. That I shall discuss later on. Here I have given some reference. Now coming to the vicious circle of poverty, uh, of which was developed by Naxi. The vicious circle of poverty you can explain either from the supply side or from the demand side. In the supply side, you start with low per capita income. Low per capita income leads to low savings in the economy. Low savings means low investment. Low investment means low capital formation because capital formation depends on savings, accumulation of savings and proper channeling of that savings into productive investment. So if there is low savings, productive investment is low and your capital formation in the country is also low. And Productivity, factor productivity in the country depends on how faster, okay, you can create capital, physical capital, which can make your system more productive. So if your capital formation is low, then your productivity is also low and your total production is low. Side by side, in this less developed economy, you are suffering from huge population growth and you, again, you bogged down to low per capita income. So you are trapped in this cycle, vicious cycle or vicious circle. Okay, this is from the supply side, supply of capital. So it explains that why, because of low supply of capital can explain the poverty trap in a nation. And you can also explain it from the demand side. You, can, you also start with low per capita income, which creates low demand for different products. And low demand means, as I have already told you, limited size of the market, and if there is limited size of the market, then the producer and investors will not be interested to invest more. And again, there will be low capital formation and the same process as before. So the vicious circle of poverty, uh, if the question comes, you explain it from these two sides and you see the reference book, Koshik Bashu, where he has given some sort of analysis. But in that book, you will not get this diagram. So draw this diagram and it will make your answer more attractive. Now come to the unit three, dual economy model. Now first I start with this concept of surplus labor and disguised unemployment. How, and, uh, how can you calculate surplus labor? Normally, normally in common parlance, we explain surplus labor. What is surplus labor? For example, normally it is very much uh, um, uh, say connected with the agrarian economy where you, if you withdraw some amount of labor from agricultural activity, and if you observe that total agricultural output remains same, and then you call them disguised the unemployed, and <laughs> you measure it, <coughs> you call them surplus. Now here, uh, um, uh, there is a concept of dynamic surplus and static surplus. Here, <coughs> first, surplus labor can be estimated by taking the distance between the available labor force in the economy, say up to L3, and the equilibrium labor employed where marginal productivity of labor is just equal to the wage rate. Okay. And this wage rate is subsistence wage. So this different distance, L0, L3 will have, will give you one measure 
of surplus in the economy. Available labor force and the equilibrium labor employment uh, following the capitalistic mode of production. Now, another aspect, while you want to measure surplus from static and dynamic point of view, static surplus means if your marginal productivity schedule is given, it doesn't change, then surplus labor can be measured by the available labor force minus the labor force where the marginal productivity is zero. Okay, so that is another measure. But if through technology change, your marginal productivity schedule changes, then your surplus measurement also changes. So that is called dynamic surplus. In this way, you will find it in <coughs> Tharwell's book. In Tharwell, you will find this difference between static surplus and dynamic surplus. But the more uh, uh, beautiful explanation was given by Amartya Sen while indicating the difference between marginal productivity of labor hour and marginal productivity of laborer. There is a distinction between marginal productivity of labor hour. If you draw the total productivity curve in this way, when you empl employ more labor hour, your productivity rises and at point E, it becomes flat. That means your marginal productivity becomes marginal productivity of labor hour becomes zero at point E. And in the this uh, uh, along the downward uh, this um, the axis, uh, you, uh, I am measuring uh, 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 measuring the number of laborers. OK, we are measuring the number of laborers as opposed to labor hours. So if you uh, if you believe that in your society, in one number of laborers are working okay to carry out this uh, work uh, which requires this particular labor hour for example say eight laborers are working and the total labor hour is 40 hours of labor hours are required to produce this output so 40 hours divided by eight people okay so per head five hours so uh, this tan of this angle in one L naught, the slope will indicate per labor individual working hour. Okay, whole labor hour OL naught divided by ON1. So individual labor hour, five hours. Now, if you withdraw three, three workers, so from eight workers, you withdraw three workers. So now there are five workers. But still, if the remaining workers are ready to work for more hours, okay, say for eight hours normal working hours, eight hours per day, then five workers, eight hours per day, together they will work for 40 hours, okay? And the work, this total output will remain unchanged. So please see that uh, marginal productivity of laborer, worker will be zero, say over this range, over a wide range, but marginal productivity of labor hour is zero at a particular point. So this is the basic difference between marginal productivity of labor hour and marginal productivity of laborer. I have given the reference. Now this is another model. Peasants and dualism with and without surplus labor. This is a, a, a paper by Amartya Sen. It was reprinted in Vadaba. And from that, I have almost typed the whole model. I have developed of my own so in, a, in an easy way. The, the crux of the model, main issues of the model, this model indicates uh, that uh, say in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a society, agrarian society, there are some farmers families, okay, uh, and each family, there are beta number of members, alpha number of working members, they have their production function, and uh, normally it is a function of labor hours, okay, L. The marginal productivity of labor is positive but diminishing. And uh, when uh, you give a particular finite value of labor hour, your output becomes maximum. Okay, that we have explained in our, our earlier diagram. And in that case, that at that maximum hour labor, uh, say output level, your marginal productivity is, uh, is zero. That can be expl one explanation of marginal productivity of labor hour. And uh, you can also explain it that in the limit, if you go on employing more and more labor hour, then ultimately the marginal productivity will be zero. This is another explanation. Okay. Now uh, there is a utility function. Utility depends on uh, individual uh, consumption of the output, where individual consumption is output part family member, which is total output of the family divided by total member family member. 
is the average output per member and you get utility and here also there is a <coughs> according to the assumption marginal utility is diminishing but uh, this is uh, very important there is a dc utility function when some uh, family workers they work for more hours uh, they, uh, they, are, they do not get utility rather uh, they are dissatisfied they are, they are, they are, that extra work extra working hour or more working hour generates dc utility okay and it is uh, and this is non decreasing function if you work for more hours your dc utility will also rise this is this is the assumption and small l indicates the individual labor hour uh, total labor hour divided by total working members in the family you get individual labor hour and the family welfare function was developed that is the summation of utility minus summation of dc utility and if we assume that work is equally divided among the family members and output income is also equally divided then you can express this welfare function in this way where what you observe that your uh, welfare is uh, beta into utility which is a function of individual output and that individual output indirectly is a function of aggregate output aggregate output is a function of aggregate labor hour so there is a chain rule you observe so now if you want to maximize this welfare function you just differentiate it with respect to labor hour and you get this result an ultimate results what does it give this result this is very important it indicates that when you put extra labor hour then the extra product this is the marginal product okay and that indicates that when you put extra labor hour then individually you are you, you are putting extra individual labor so you are getting this utility but that extra labor hour gives you extra output also okay and that gives you utility so to get extra utility how much cost you are have so that is this utility so this ratio marginal this utility by marginal utility is nothing but the marginal rate of substitution of q for l that is what amount of this utility you are sacrificing you are having to have one extra unit of output so that is called as real cost of labor and uh, <coughs> this can be uh, indicated with the help of this output growth curve and the uh, 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 the indifference curve approach where labor is a bad commodity okay because it uh, it creates this utility and individual output is good quality good good commodity and here you can indicate that equilibrium where uh, the slope of the output growth curve that is marginal product is equal to the marginal rate of substitution which is mul by mu okay now uh, how can you show the existence of surplus labor here the model sub, uh, proposes that if you withdraw now some amount of working member okay because your total labor hour is working member multiplied by the individual labor hour so if you withdraw some working member then what will happen what will happen total labor hour will fall if total labor hour falls then the, since the first order derivative is positive that is the marginal product is positive your total output will fall okay so if you are to keep your total output constant okay to to indicate the existence of surplus labor then you are to assume something so in this model equation assume that up to a certain individual labor hour that dz utility will remain unchanged this is one assumption for example say normal working hour is 8 hours so in my earlier example what i have suggested that before the withdrawal of workers individual labor hour was 5 hours now when you withdraw some workers the residual members are now putting more labor hours but if they are not having this utility up to 8 hours of labor then this is the assumption then their dc utility will not change so dc utility will remain unchanged up to a certain amount of individual labor hour and it is also assumed that up to a certain increase in individual output okay marginal utility will be unaffected so these are the two assumptions where uh, in the model you will find that this marginal utility was considered as a numerator it, it was uh, valued as one and so this real cost of labor was actually the marginal productivity of output marginal productivity of labor okay and uh, with the help of this diagram uh, i have i have tried to indicate or analyze okay uh, uh, the this uh, existence of uh, surplus labor now in this model please see 
Uh, in the first quadrant, this is the marginal productivity line. And the 45 degree line shows the labor hour. And this T, T line, and here uh, in the fourth quadrant, we have indicated the DZ utility and the individual labor. So the ray of this T line indicates, the slope of the ray indicates the working members of the family, okay? Because L, total labor hour, divided by individual labor hour is nothing but the in number of workers in the family. Now, if you, if you withdraw some working hours, the slope will fall and the slope will fall means individual labor hour will rise. Please see, up to L star, this, this utility remains unchanged. So this flat portion indicates that up to a certain portion of individual labor hour, this utility will remain unchanged and hence you can explain the existence of surplus labor and the most important part of this model is that the assumption or the notion of zero marginal productivity of labor is neither necessary nor a sufficient condition for the existence of surplus labor here i have uh, used two diagrams to indicate it. first left this left panel indicates that at point t Marginal productivity of labor is positive, okay? Total labor hour, L0. Working members, alpha 1. Now, if you withdraw the working members, but they are not ready to work for higher working hours. So, if they work for same individual working hours as before, then there will be a parallel shift. Okay, this L1, alpha 2, this will be parallel to, parallel to L0, alpha 1. That means individual working hour will remain same so that total output will fall so total output doesn't remain unchanged so even if when marginal productivity is zero any finite withdrawal of working members from the family may lead to a fall in the aggregate output and you will find the existence of surplus labor but but if according to shen's model if the remaining workers are ready to work for more hours without any DZ utility, then however, total output really remains same. So it depends upon their attitude. Okay. So you can prove the existence of surplus labor or not, depending upon that attitude. So it can happen when marginal productivity is greater than zero. It can happen when marginal productivity is zero. Okay. Please, uh, uh, sorry. Rishab, I am in a meeting. Okay. Uh, please, uh, up to one hour. Uh, so, in, in, in the right hand panel, what you observe, uh, you observe that here marginal productivity is zero. Okay. Here marginal productivity was po positive in, my, in the left panel. In the right panel, here it is zero. But whenever it is zero, still now you can prove that if the after the with finite withdrawal of working members, okay, if they are not ready to work for more hours, then also there will be existence of surplus. Uh, there will not there will, uh, there will no uh, surplus labor because output will fall so all depends on the readiness of the workers to do extra work working hour without having this utility up to a certain level so whether your marginal productivity is positive or zero okay doesn't uh, create any difference regarding so far, so far as the existence of surplus labor is concerned is it clear I think uh, this was my explanation and I am taking much more time, uh, but I have to finish. Interdependence of agriculture and industry, this, uh, uh, the Lewis model, okay, and that I, I, I shall take a very less time in a Lewis model because it is very much common. It was earlier, it was there. Teachers are also do not find any difficulty in uh, this particular, uh, uh, this particular model, explaining this model. I'm just giving you the basic flavor of Lewis model. Lewis model it is a dualistic development model. It is a dualistic development model. Lewis model is a dualistic development model. That means on the one hand, there is an underdeveloped agricultural sector. On the other hand, there is a relatively better developed industrial sector. Okay. And Lewis described that in the underdeveloped agricultural sector, there is uh, uh, a surplus labor, existence of surplus labor. Uh, this in the, with the help of this diagram Lewis indicated that if this is a subsistence wage rate in the agricultural sector then 
uh, the equilibrium uh, employment may be L1. So beyond L1, any amount of labor, their marginal productivity is less than the wage rate and they will be ready to shift to industrial sector. And the industrial sector will then have the facility of having that sub, uh, say supply of unlimited, they call it unlimited supply of labor at a given wage rate. In this way, how the industrial sector can create, uh, uh, say, capital okay, or surplus. This is the industrial sector, industrial wage rate. This is industrial marginal productivity. So when they employ L1, they pay their wage rate. This is the wage payment, OWMEL1. And the total output is sum over mar marginal product. So OAEL1. So this area, AWME, will be the industrial surplus. If they invest it, okay, for productivity growth, then marginal productivity cur curve is believed to shift upward and equilibrium employment will rise. Equilibrium, uh, the surplus amount will rise and they will further invest it. So this will explain the growth in a capitalistic economy, in a dualistic economy, uh, in a dualistic economy, where the growth depends on the role of the capitalist. But uh, if you observe this uh, marginal productivity schedule of the rural sector, okay, here we are measuring the origin of the rural sector and the origin of the modern industrial sector in the same diagram. So if you consider this rightward shift of the marginal productivity schedule of the industrial sector, but when they cross this point G, any further rightward shift, what it will indicate? It will indicate that now the marginal productivity of labor in the rural area is more than the industrial wage rate. So now they will not be willing to, em to be employed in that old wage rate. They will now claim higher wage rate. And this is the turning point according to the Lewis. So this is about the Lewis model. And this turning point, uh, Lewis uh, has not explained that how this agriculture can be made commercialized. It, there can be more development, simultaneous development in industry and agriculture, simultaneous, a balanced type of growth. That was, uh, as I say, explained by uh, Rennes and Fay. So I'm coming to Rennes Fay model. Uh, I do not have much time. I shall send it to you and you can study the critical estimation uh, evaluation of Lewis model. Okay. Uh, John Fay and Gustav Rennes, uh, in their work, they have uh, they have studied that how in a dualistic development model on the on the basis of the same type of assumptions as uh, made in the Lewis model, uh, this uh, they have <coughs> they have made a separate model just showing different phases of development in agricultural sector. The first phase they have indicated uh, a phase of development where the surplus workers in agriculture can be shifted to industry without any loss of output in the agricultural sector. How uh, you define surplus? So they define surplus that in the uh, agricultural sector, the marginal productivity, uh, then it is zero. And uh, the wage rate is equal to the average product of labor. And they call it institutionally given wage rate. In this model, it is called institutional wage rate. This is nothing but average product of labor uh, in the agricultural sector okay and they can be shifted and when can be shifted to industry okay the industry can employ that amount of surplus labor at a given wage rate and obviously that is almost equal to okay its real value will be equal to the agricultural wage rate that institutional wage rate okay and in the second phase we'll observe that when the marginal productivity is falling okay when uh, the marginal productivity is positive, okay, but it is rising, sorry, marginal productivity is positive, but it is rising in agriculture. However, the marginal productivity in agriculture is less than the institutional wage rate. That is the second phase. And here, disguised unemployment in agriculture has been defined. The existence of some labor who are disguisedly unemployed, the uh, uh, indication is that the marginal productivity of agricultural labor there, it is less than the institutional wage rate. Okay, but marginal productivity is rising, and ultimately, what will happen? And then also, the, those disguisedly unemployed people, they will be shifted to industrial sector. But the situation is now different. 
Another notion was introduced in this model is agricultural surplus. Total agricultural surplus is the difference between the total product and the amount of commodities consumed in the agricultural sector. And gradually, if, uh, if you divide that surplus by the workers employed in the industrial sector, you can determine the average surplus, average agricultural surplus. So with the increase in industrial laborers, your average agricultural surplus will fall. So when average agricultural surplus will fall, that will create a shortage okay, in the system. And that shortage in the system will lead to a price hike of, in the, of agricultural goods. And in the industrial sector, the terms of trade will move against the industries. And to maintain, to compensate the industrial workers, their, their, this wage rate in the industrial sector has to be increased. So that explains the turning point just like Wix. Ultimately, what will happen? A stage will come when marginal product of labor in agriculture will just be equal to the institutional wage rate. And beyond that, there comes the commercial stage of agricultural growth. Here I have drawn it. Let's see. So this is the first panel of the diagram which shows industrial sector, just like Lewis model. The first turning point is here from where this can be regarded as the supply curve of labor in the industrial sector. Okay, here we measure uh, the labor employment in the industrial sector from left to right. Okay, and these are the surplus, but this is the first turning point. But uh, T2 is the second turning point, how it happens. Let's see, the second panel indicates the agricultural sector, but here labor, okay, the labor employment in agriculture is being measured from right to left, from right, please see, OA, it is the origin of agriculture, that, uh, this labor employment, and this is measured along the horizontal axis, right to left. So up to, please see, the last panel. Here, this is the out from right to left. As you employ more labor, your productivity growth, this is the productivity growth line, OAX. And ultimately, what you observe, it is a flat schedule. That means marginal productivity is zero. But if you believe that all the workers are engaged to produce this total output, OX, then average product, average productivity in agriculture will be the slope of this diagonal OAX. And that slope will indicate the institutional wage rate W bar here in the middle panel. So here up to NL2, this amount is called as the surplus labor. Why? Because marginal product is zero. But beyond it, shortage will arise. So this point S is the point of shortage beyond which we see your production, total output, agricultural output is falling, but you are consuming at the same rate. So, and your industrial employment is rising. So your average agricultural surplus is falling. So S, A, A, S, this curve is average agricultural surplus, which is falling. But the slope of the total product curve gives you the marginal product in agriculture. Please see, up to L2, level of employment, it is zero. But beyond it, the slope of the total product curve is positive, okay, and it is rising. And at point E, the slope of the total, let's say marginal product, is just equal to the slope of this average product, which is equal to the institutional wage. So they are, they are same. Okay. So beyond that, what happens now? Now the marginal product of labor in the agriculture is more than the slope is more than the slope of the this diagonal. That means the institutionally given wage rate, this W bar, but the slope of the marginal product is more. So this marginal product of labor in agriculture is rising, rising. So now they will start bargaining. Now agricultural laborers, they are observing that their marginal product is more than the institutional wage. So they will now bargain. And this carved portion indicates that the agricultural wage rate may also in increase. Okay. And so there is a steep increase in the marginal product and it indicates the second turning point in this particular model. In this way, Rennes Fay model explains different stages of agricultural development. Okay. Uh, I'm taking much time because uh, this is a long uh, syllabus. I shall send you all these documents so that you can study of your own. 
I have typed it of my own. Uh, the rural urban migration, Harris Todaro, this is also old syllabus model. And uh, Harris Todaro, I'm just giving you the flavor. Harris Todaro model, this is also dualistic development model. It suggests that whenever there's a migration from rural to urban area, then the rural workers, they take the migration decision on the basis of probable probability of higher getting higher wage rate in the urban sector probability and they measure this probability okay and uh, this model suggests that uh, the total labor force is l bar rural employment is lr so total urban labor force is l bar minus lr urban unemployment will be this urban labor force minus urban employment and this uh, this is WR is agricultural wage rate and agricultural wage rate is less than industrial wage rate W. Okay. And there are some assumptions and this is the probability. Okay. Of getting urban employment. What is the probability? Urban employment divided by urban labor force. Okay. How much? What is the percentage of them? They're getting employed. So this is the expected urban income, wage income, because if you multiply that wage rate, urban wage rate, multiplied by the probability of getting an urban job, you get the expected urban wage income. And if that expected urban income, wage income is more than the rural wage, which is, which is uh, where the probability is one, that is, it is assured, ensured, <coughs> then there will be rural, uh, there will be rural urban migration because the rural workers will migrate. So when the rural workers migrate, okay, this urban labor force will rise and the probability of getting employment will fall so ultimately this inequality will come to an equality okay the probability of getting urban urban uh, wage rate will be equal to probable urban wage rate will be equal to that of rural wage rate and migration will come to a halt and from here <coughs> you can you can estimate okay from just simple estimation you can estimate that the rate of change that is change in rural uh, it's a labor force due to a change in urban employment. That means whenever there is an urban employment creation, there will be a migration from rural area, rural to urban area, and uh, uh, and it will be negative. That is, a rise in employment opportunity in urban area will lead to uh, fall in rural employment. That is, they will leave the rural sector and to the uh, extent of WY, uh, WR, this unit. Okay. This is the extent of this migration. Similarly, we can show that if this is the total uh, labor force, which is urban labor employment, rural labor employment, and urban un unemployed. And here, the simple, uh, this, uh, say, uh, this simplification, uh, you can show uh, that your change in urban un unemployment and its relationship with change in employment. We see that it is positive, and we can prove that whenever there is urban employment creation urban unemployment will also rise. Actually, this happened in Kenya and Kenyan government uh, just gave this particular responsibility on Tornado and Smith uh, to, to search out what is the exact cause of that despite creation of employment opportunities in the urban area, why urban unemployment is rising. So this is um, the um, migration process and the factors responsible behind such migration was responsible. And I have given the extended model okay and this is very easy uh, some production functions and uh, this is the restriction uh, that means if you have full employment then rural employment plus urban employment must absorb the total uh, say uh, labor force in the economy and uh, uh, this is uh, this is the force for uh, this is uh, the factor behind uh, um, this migration at equilibrium uh, this this will there is marginal productivity uh, rural wage rate will be determined the, by the marginal productivity of labor in the rural area. Okay. And uh, this utility function will be uh, equal to the aggregate output in the society. Uh, and uh, this, uh, you want to maximize this utility subject to these constraints that you must have full employment and there must be, uh, say, social utility maximized when this uh, marginal productivity uh, of labor in the rural and urban area will be seen. And that we can. Uh, so with the help of simple diagram, okay, because here, if there is rural uh, employment up to Elster and the remaining employment in urban area, then only your marginal productivity of labor will be equal and your total 
product will be maximum your utility will be maximum you can use your lagrange multiplier okay this uh, constraint optimization uh, problem you can utilize and you can uh, find out the same result and you can find out the optimum uh, uh, say a vector of these variables and this diagram will, you will find in uh, uh, this koshik bashu's book and here uh, i can just give you an explanation of this diagram uh, this is from the left to right this origin of modern sector this is the marginal productivity of the modern sector the left to right this is marginal productivity of the rural sector f prime r and uh, the equilibrium uh, employment must be a, a rural and urban employment must be here but because of some minimum wages act in the urban area which cannot fall below w1 so uh, your uh, aggregate wage payment is here w bar into l not m now if you want to find out the corresponding rural employment then you can draw one a uh, rectangular hyperbola and that uh, area o o m q into uh, o m l not r will give you the same area because this is the rectangle hyperbola and this uh, process will help will help you to uh, explain the formula given developed by uh, harris and todar because uh, o m w bar is the urban wage rate o m l not m is urban employment so you multiply it and what is omq this is rural wage rate and what is oml not r this is total labor force in the economy minus uh, labor employed in the rural sector that is the remaining oml not r is the available labor force in the urban area so you can write it like this these two areas are same and from this you can deduct that the result is similar to that of your result where the migration comes to a halt so this is all about the migration model okay so now if the government wants to increase urban employment okay from l not m to k again that is from n to n1 then how can you measure the corresponding rural employment again you draw the this hyperbola and uh, at point g again you calculate and what you observe you observe that when your urban employment rises by this amount your rural employment fall by this amount what does it mean that means a lot r j amount of laborer they are migrating to urban areas so whenever you create more employment opportunity in the urban area there will be migration so you cannot solve the problem of unemployment in urban area so how to solve it now come to the policy prescription the policy prescription is that if you encourage the urban producers to increase the employment They're by by giving them wage subsidy you give them subsidy and if you take measures so that the productivity agricultural productivity can be increased okay so productivity curve shifts upward then you get the new new uh, equilibrium at point n1 and you can attain that ideal equilibrium okay so that explains i have given you the reference now tilak uh, can you uh, tell me that uh, should i continue because i have more to speak should i continue tilak can you tell me that should i continue or not a very very difficult question that you have asked it's <laughs> almost 8 o'clock i yes. must be tired how much portion is left how much more minute you may take uh actually uh, this is half of the total this is half so what i suggest uh, uh, either you can arrange on some other day because as i have already told now i want to give the whole uh, say detail of it or should i just uh, very rapidly i just uh, give you some of the portions can i do that then do which one is better can i see, organi can I see organizing another day is not any problem uh so because uh, or, or, because or, or, sir or, or, is also very much tired and uh, uh, no no so, uh, if you if you give me half an hour within half an hour i can give you a total picture okay just half an hour is it okay is it okay for other students yeah that is the question actually i i may proceed with another half an hour one hour no problem but 
those who are listening milendu what is your i think sir we can organize on another day if sir is available i i am always available i am always available uh, and uh, because of uh, i know that this is a very big uh, thing to discuss ah this okay. is a very big and the approach that you have taken uh, yeah uh, getting into the uh, finer integration of the entire syllabus entire, good thing entire. and i prefer that in, instead of hushing up with the entire thing which is still at least 40 to 50% yes it is better it is better that you maintain the quality without hushing up and yes. uh, if you can provide time another day for about 40 to 45 minutes then it will come to yeah, an end yes yes i am ready i am ready so i think uh, i think we should uh, go for an extension of this webinar okay, on a suitable date very soon okay okay the wish is that that is that is much more wiser uh, I, I think that is that should be the prudent approach yeah and yeah otherwise uh, otherwise, otherwise if, if we go on explaining and uh, it will be no, the, the 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 fantastic quality that you have maintained till now just <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, i won't prefer that you, you hush up huh, okay. actually uh, actually uh, uh, what i was feeling that i was just like moving to your college uh say a non stop galloping train i was a <laughs> bit faster because in my in my mind uh, uh, i had in my mind that i have to finish no but you cannot imagine the uh, this labor i have given i'm very no no that is quite evident acha why should we decide only uh, madam ruby pal you are here what is your suggestion should we not proceed for another day within say another 4 or 5 days Yes, I think that is better. That uh, is better. For me because, also, uh, because some important issues are there. Important mm -hmm. issues are there. Yeah, the yeah. Last one, the institutional uh, and uh, political. Madam, 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 Ruby Pal, please uh, tell, give your observation. I think it is better if she, if if Dr. Devashish Vozumdar continues another day, because okay. uh, it is really very difficult to. make it a very brief analysis of the remaining part yes the way he is proceeding it is unique so it is better if we can hear him some other day we can always organize it's up, up to devashish mojumdar if he can provide time madam gargi yes. vashu yes sir what is it is better that is better to arrange thing. another day exactly because uh, unit 6 is very important i think yeah yeah, yeah. Urmi, should we should we proceed to the other day acha matha nahi reche thik ache nilendu we will talk to devashish da and then uh, we will uh, decide on a different day okay i think that would be better so okay, so, uh, so, uh, so uh, i think normally normally nilendu you you may remember that when uh, when koshik uh, koshik uh, professor koshik kumar gupta he arranges this type of uh, say prolonged session the morning yeah. session and afternoon session afternoon yes, session yes he, he, he continues for 4 hours so yeah, um, at least 4 to 5 hours for 4 to 5 hours so uh, within 2 hours it is not possible so i would request the organizer to arrange another day so that i can finish okay okay sir already there is demand for this study material in the youtube no no, no 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 first first the lecture should be there the insight should be delivered oh, wow. and then some interaction and then the study material this particular practice of getting the study material without getting into the discussion and the listening to the deliberations is not very fair so first the deliberation should complete get complete and uh, it will get complete i think within uh, should we fix the date now or we will talk it talk to it later on we'll talk to it uh, yes you can you can talk to me and uh, we can we can fix we'll fix, we can fix the date fix the date okay so, so that, uh, it can be within a week so it can be within a week uh. within a week within a week it will be done so yes, uh, yeah, exam is coming up so within a week yeah, is we'll better do it this week only okay 
so uh, we come to an what to say not an end we come to fast part this is the fast part we, we, we come to an intermission we come to an intermission of the uh, webinar now this will be described as part 1 and part 2 of the webinar so the yes. part 1 has come to an end uh, as one of the co organizers i feel that the webinar should continue to on to a second day so that the quality with which it started at 6 pm and continued till 8 o'clock the quality should be maintained instead yes. of uh, uh, trying to score too many runs into the last few overs and losing wickets that i won't <laughs> prefer <laughs> that i won't yes. prefer so uh i would the like quality to, has been uh, excellent yeah yeah i would like to uh say two stories mane etokkhon pore abar dutor story ami bolbo to dutor story ektu shune nin first story ta hocche thank you second story ta hocche thank you very much with this to two stories i so sweet, so sweet story <laughs> i come to the end of the first part of the webinar delivered by professor uh, Devashish Majumdar, and with the honest and objective opinion coming from Dr. Ruby Pal, Dr. Gargi Vasu, and Dr. Ulmi Mukherjee, all of us we conclude that we will very soon get into the second session of this webinar, and uh, we'll meet the students again. Thank you. Ilendu, kichu bola thakle bolo. Na sir, kichu bola nahi. Thank you very much. Devashish, the on a personal note. i'm really really amazed to see that uh, tirelessly ki sundor tumi bolle ha erom bhabe chhatro ra erom bhabe chhatro ra jodi tirelessly pore phele shotti oder jibon onek unnati hobe no am to bolchi ami je bhabe toiri korechi the way i have prepared it just it will it is sufficient to get first class marks just just sufficient to get first class marks ami dekhe bujhlam mane আমি এবং নীলেন্দু আজকে সারা দিন ধরে একটা অন্য ট্রেনিং প্রোগ্রামে ছিলাম ইট ওয়াজ উইচ ওয়াজ ভেরি হ্যাভি কিন্তু আমি ওখান থেকে বেরিয়েই এখানে ঢুকেছি এবং তারপর আবার হোমওয়ার্ক আছে সেইখানে এখন পিপিটি তৈরি করতে হবে ইত্যাদি কিন্তু আমি এক মিনিটের জন্য মানে আমি গ্লুড রিয়েলি অ্যামেজড খুব ভালো হয়েছে লেটস হোক নীলেন্দু প্লিজ দেবাশিসদের সঙ্গে যোগাযোগ রেখে আর একটা দিন ঠিক করো করে আমরা সেকেন্ড পার্টটা শেষ করব No thank you no thank you professor ruby pal gargi madam thank you madam thank, thank you sir. everybody and sir, also thank you sir huh? thank you thank you basis sir theke amrao shiklam how to teach onek kichu janla onek ta nijeder quality ta holo thank you sir thank you just one information i want to know how many students join that i will check and i'll tell you Okay, okay. One problem has taken place from heritage. Oh. Was it necessary to get any administrator's approval or something like that? Administrator. I don't know anything about. Uh, I don't know anything about this approval or anything. I have sent the link to all through email, huh. and I have sent this link to all by eleven o'clock in the morning. I think. but uh, somebody told my son that there is a necessity of any approval what is that approval i don't understand anyway i'll talk to you later on okay 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 thank you okay thank you nitale i'm leave korchi okay leave korchi hello okay sir bye